Welcome back to Best of the Day from the 55th Annual Meeting of the American Society of Hematology. We're talking about chronic lymphocytic leukemia this morning. Uh, I'm sitting with Dr. Jennifer Brown from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. We've already talked about a lot of the new upfront data uh, for CLL, and now we're going to talk about some of the treatments that are being advanced for more relapse disease. So thanks again, Jennifer, for being here. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure. So one of the things that's been really interesting in the uh, acute <clears throat> leukemia field, uh, specifically ALL, in the past couple years has been the amazing work coming out of Carl June and David Porter's labs at Penn with the use of chimeric antigen receptor modified T cells targeted at C19. It's just the science of this, I think, is, is fascinating that they can harvest your T cells, uh, train them to target CD19, expand them uh, ex vivo, and then reinfuse them and get uh, tremendous results without any evidence of graft versus host disease. Um, and in even people who've been really far advanced with, with their leukemia and relapse several times. <coughs> But now they're looking also at chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So tell us about the, the reports from this year's meeting. I think there was one from Sloan Kettering and then one also from David Porter's group. Right. So David Porter's group both updated their earlier pilot trial and then talked about a trial where they're comparing two different dose levels of the CAR T cells in CLL. And the earlier pilot trial continues to look quite amazing. There are two patients in ongoing complete remission over 36 months out from that therapy, mm -hmm. despite having quite relapsed refractory disease. And today, Dr. Porter reported on 18 patients from the comparison of two different dose levels of the CARs. The data were very early. The primary endpoint is actually a three-month response evaluation, mm -hmm. but they reported on patients even only at one month. So it's a very preliminary look. We may not want to make too much of it. Right. But they didn't see any difference in the two different dose levels, which I think makes some sense since these T cells expand greatly once they're administered to the patient. Sure. Exactly. The response rate was 39%, or seven of the patients, with three complete remissions. The partial remissions were patients who were clearing blood and bone marrow but still had some lymph nodes which were resolving. Now, this response rate is lower than they've previously reported, and they don't really know what predicts which patients will be able to respond to the CAR T cells and which patients won't. I think that's a topic of great interest for them. If we could figure out who responds, then we might be able to intervene for the patients who are not responding. So they don't know whether it's a matter of the extent of CD19 expression on the CLL cells or whether there are other interfering factors? Right. CD19 expression is usually pretty high on CLL cells, so I think it may not be that, at least for initial response. It may relate to other aspects of immune function or dysfunction mm -hmm. in the patients. But I think they're working mm -hmm. very intensively on that, but they don't know yet. Have they been able to tell anything about the degree of T-cell expansion in vivo? Does that correlate at all with response? So in the pilot study, that did correlate with response. And some of the patients who didn't respond didn't have much T cell expansion, whereas others had greater than a thousandfold. Mm. But they didn't comment on that in today's presentation in relation to response. It would be interesting to watch the progress of that research. And I wonder whether at some point they'll think about adding immune checkpoint inhibitors along with the, uh, the uh, CAR T cells to see if that will augment the response. It should be very interesting. I think that's very interesting, although one probably has to take very great care with that because if you don't know which patient ahead of time is going to have the massive expansion, which is associated with this cytokine release right. syndrome, you don't want to enhance that. Yeah. It would probably be more see who does respond and those who don't then maybe try to intervene. Right. With. Yeah, very interesting. So let's go on and talk about um, one of the BCR uh, signaling pathway inhibitors, the BTK, or Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitor, Ibrutinib, uh, now called Imbruvica. 
which was just uh, approved by the uh, FDA for mantle cell lymphoma. But um, there's been a tremendous amount of work in CLL, and I'm sure the, uh, the, the company will be going for that indication since it's a much more common disease. And there was uh, a trial that you presented, ibrutinib in combination with BR, and we've seen a lot of single agent activity, but the idea of combining these novel BCR signaling inhibitors with standard regimens certainly is logical. Um, how does it work? Is there any added adverse events, any added efficacy, um, anything that you were really impressed with or any concerns that you saw? So it works very well. There really is no enhanced toxicity. The patients tolerated the combination of abrutinib BR very well, and we also even treated three patients with abrutinib FCR, and it was very well tolerated by all of them. I was quite impressed with the depth of response particularly in the FCR patients, but also in some of the BR patients, which appeared to be greater. Although the overall complete remission rate on the BR arm was about 17%, and then there were an additional 10% of nodular PRs, but that's a somewhat immature response evaluation from relatively early on in the study. And my experience has been that as patients continue on abrutinib after the BR, sometimes they can have ongoing improvement in their response. So we're looking to update that data further. At the moment, it's still a little hard to tell how the combination compares to single agent or abrutinib with rituximab because the follow-up on the combinations is still so short compared to the single agent follow-up. Yeah, the, the combination of abrutinib or idelalisib with rituximab always made sense to me because you release all these lymphocytes out into the circulation where then the monoclonal antibody could hit them, and I, I would think Obinutuzumab is going to be combined with ibrutinib and idelalisib as well to, to try and take advantage of that, that same scenario. Absolutely. The same even applies to chemotherapy. Once you, these drugs, the BCR inhibitors, move the CLL cells from the sanctuary sites, lymph nodes and bone marrow, into blood, where it's always been easier to kill them with anything, monoclonal antibodies or chemotherapy. Well, and we've, we've talked about... Um, the, the deletion 17P and the TP53 mutations and how this is such a prognostically bad category of, of CLL patients. And in a lot of Michael Keating's FCR uh, data, the 17P deleted patients did not do re nearly as well with, uh, with FCR as other groups did. And in the CLL10 uh, protocol, they even excluded uh, Del 17P patients uh, because I think they knew that the responses weren't going to be as good. But um, what about these novel agents, these BCR signaling in inhibitors? Are they affected in the same manner or can they still have the same degree of efficacy against these high-risk patients? Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting question that to some extent is still evolving. In many of the abrutinib studies, all of them essentially, there's been no difference in response rate, even in patients with 17P versus not. So 17P patients are equally likely to respond. However, it does appear in some of the longer term follow-up studies like the pharmacyclic sponsored phase 1B that some of the more early relapses are in 17P patients. Although we did hear yesterday from Adrian Wiesner's group at NHLBI that in their study, they've really seen equivalent quality of responses and durability thus far in 17P patients, but their follow-up is shorter. So I would say that the novel agents are not affected as negatively by 17P deletion, mm -hmm. but the jury is still out in terms of whether the durability will be equivalent in that patient population. Because some of those 17P patients have had to go on to allogeneic transplants. Um, do you think abrutinib or idelalisib are going to be good bridges to transplant for those patients? So they're profoundly effective as bridges to transplant because response rate is equivalent. You can get very high response rates better than with standard mm -hmm. therapies. I think many people are very enthusiastic about not transplanting even 17P patients treated with those drugs. And I'm fairly cautious about that because of this question of durability. I think many of these high-risk 17P patients should still think seriously about 
transplant once they get in remission with these drugs. And with, with drugs like ibrutinib, um, these are going to be used pretty much long term for a lot of these patients. Any adverse events that are showing up with prolonged therapy that didn't show up in the initial early 6-12 months of treatment? Not yet that we know of. The main safety signal of concern with the brutinib, I think, is potential bleeding events, as there have been some significant hemorrhages in the studies to date. And there needs to be caution in combining it with anticoagulants, especially warfarin. But it's not clear that that risk worsens over time. I am a little concerned over time as to the effect on immune function and immunoglobulins. There are data reported at one year suggesting that there's no worsening of immunoglobulins and even uh, an improvement in IgA. But one year follow-up may not be long enough for us to know. So I think that is a very important question that we'll need to watch as time goes on. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned the bleeding. Um, yesterday, uh, Steve Treon, also from the Dana-Farber, talked about the amazing responses with ibrutinib in Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. Uh, and he mentioned that bleeding was a problem, but they got the impression that bleeding was more common in patients who were taking a lot of fish oils. And that when they told those patients to stop their fish oils, that bleeding was, was not as much of a problem. And I don't know what the mechanism of that is, but he said that was one of the things that they had noticed, at least in their Waldenstrom population. Yes, and now there are recommendations actually that patients on ibrutinib not take fish oil or vitamin E. It is fairly well known that fish oil can cause various perturbations of coagulation in a subset of patients, although I'm not aware of the mechanism, and that may be apparently enhanced in the context of ibrutinib. Very interesting, very interesting. And the little data like that is important for people in practice. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, the other BTK inhibitor, and I'm sure there are a number of them in, in pipelines, but the, uh, the ONO4059, um, this is further down. This was just some phase one uh, data in relapse refractory uh, CLL. How does this agent look, and how does it differ from uh, ibrutinib? Mm -hmm. So it appears to be a more specific BTK inhibitor, in the presentation yesterday, they showed that it has less activity against Sark family kinases, for example, which ibrutinib also hits. So being a more specific BTK inhibitor could be both good and bad. Yeah. Exactly. But the data were quite early that they showed yesterday, but response rates looked extremely promising, as did tolerability. Ultimately, I think durability is really the key. But the data look very promising. They're just early. So initially, with, with the brutinib, it can't be stated for certain that all of the efficacy is due strictly to targeting BTK. There may be some off-target uh, benefits as well that might not be seen with the more specific agents. Right. There's been significant speculation that given that ibrutinib <coughs> hits a variety of other kinases, including ITK, which John Bird's group has shown that ibrutinib covalently inhibits ITK, just as it does BTK, that some of those off-target effects may contribute to efficacy. I do think that the fact that we have now seen resistance mutations within the BTK target residue of ibrutinib mm -hmm. does speak to the fact that hitting BTK is probably the primary effect right. of ibrutinib, but it's still possible that there may be some other activities contributing to efficacy. Very good. And is, is BTK, is it an ATP competitive inhibitor? I know it binds to a cysteine uh, So it's actually a, a covalent inhibitor. It binds oh, okay. covalently to cysteine 481, and that's true of ibrutinib and the ONO compound both. And so the PK and PD are actually separated. You can dose once daily, and although you won't have any circulating drug in the latter part of that 24-hour interval, you get complete 24-hour inhibition of BTK because of the covalent nature of the interaction. So how do these mutations uh, blunt the uh, beneficial effects of ibrutinib? So it's a cysteine residue to which ibrutinib binds covalently, and the mutations convert cysteine to serine, and ibrutinib can no longer bind covalently. I it does see. actually have some activity as a non-covalent inhibitor, 
but I've seen estimates that that varies between 25 and 100 fold less, and it has been associated with clinical relapse. Very good. All right, Jennifer, thank you so much. We're going to take another quick break, and we're going to come back and talk about some additional novel agents, uh, including BCL2 inhibitors and uh, PI3 kinase inhibitors. So stick with us. We'll be right back.